Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for the, the nice introduction. Ma mère le disait, pour savoir où on s'en va, il faut savoir d'où on vient. Donc, euh, le premier panel ce matin, pour, comment, pour ouvrir la conférence, va donner euh, une perspective sur euh, l'action collective. Chacun des euh, euh, les personnes qui vont présenter vont parler de l'action collective au Québec avec le professeur Jules Fra, que je vais vous présenter, en Ontario, le professeur Walker et le professeur Isaac Haroff, qui vient de New York University. Donc, pour votre information, je, je suis en pratique privée. Euh, pratiquant ici à Montréal, principalement du côté euh, de la défense, dans, une, euh, dans un bureau euh, qui est à plus, euh, plus euh, petit effet. Donc, starting with Janet Walker. Professor Walker <coughs> is a professor at Osgoode Hall, she, where she also serves as associate dean. She has lectured all over the world, from Zagreb to Wuhan, and was a visiting professor at Oxford University. She is the author of Canadian Conflict of Law, the editor of the Civil Litigation Process and the editor of Class Action in Canada. Daniel Jutra, who plusieurs d'entre vous connaissez, is the Wainwright Chair at the McGill University Faculty of Law and was Dean of the Faculty from 2010 to 2016. His research interests are in civil law, comparative law, obligations, and civil procedure. Professor Jutra has served at the Supreme Court of Canada on two occasions, once, at its, once as its executive legal officer and again as amicus curie in the reference on the reform of the Senate. Even though he has all those credentials from McGill, was still invited in since he did all of that and in that's Samuel Isakarov is the Reef Professor <coughs> of Constitutional Law at New York University School of Law. His research interests include civil procedure, complex litigation, law and economics, and employment law. He is the author of several books on democracy and electoral law, campaign finance, and of course class actions and other aggregate litigation. Professor Isakarov is an important voice in the legal and political discourse in the United States, as can be seen from several appearances in the New York, New York Times, in the New Yorker, and even on Charlie Rose on the PBS network. So we will uh, start with uh, Professor Jutra, who will, as I was saying in the introduction, give us an historical perspective and also talk about the role of class actions in public law, and the fact that we haven't seen many in the world. Merci beaucoup Marie. Bonjour à tous. Je suis très content, comme, comme Marie vient de dire, d'être ici à l'Université de Montréal, mon alma mater. Euh, je reviens toujours avec plaisir et c'est un grand honneur pour moi d'être de faire partie de ce panel parce que j'ai beaucoup de respect pour les deux autres conférenciers qui sont avec moi, qui sont vraiment des leaders dans leur champ. Je me sens un peu euh, euh, intimidé. Parce que je sors à peine de mon lac doyen où, euh, pendant sept ans, le cerveau devient un peu euh, délatineux. Euh, 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 moins de temps de, de réfléchir. Alors, je commence à peine à retrouver mes marques euh, de chercheurs après, euh, après quelques mois euh, de, de congé euh, après mon mandat administratif. Je suis d'autant euh, plus heureux d'être ici ce matin que euh, je pense qu'on peut le dire maintenant sans se tromper que l'Université de Montréal et le laboratoire euh, mené par Catherine Piché sont vraiment le, le cœur et l'âme du recours collectif au Québec. Euh, C'est avec beaucoup de fierté que je vois Catherine Piché mener ce laboratoire. Catherine euh, a été étudiante de doctorat à l'Université de McGill sous ma direction, mais jamais entre guillemets, parce que c'était un rapport très inégal. Ça arrive assez souvent, d'ailleurs, dans les contextes de supervision où l'étudiant, et dans ce, ce cas-ci, l'étudiante est largement supérieur dans ses connaissances et sa vision du dossier, euh, euh, largement supérieur au supérieur. Alors j'ai beaucoup appris avec Catherine et je suis très content de voir euh, le succès euh, de ce laboratoire auquel je m'associe à grand plaisir. 
Euh, je vais faire euh, ma présentation, euh, je vais tout de suite être dans le vif du sujet parce qu'on s'est entendu entre nous qu'on parlait très brièvement, 10, peut-être 15 minutes si la présidente m'autorise à, à exagérer un peu, euh, pour laisser le plus de temps possible à la conversation, aux questions venant de la salle et, et idéalement aux échanges entre nous. Euh, je vais faire ma présentation en anglais parce que je l'ai préparé euh, avant de savoir qu'il y aurait une traduction simultanée. Alors je, J'espère que ce n'est pas un faux pas diplomatique euh, de venir à l'Université de Montréal euh, et euh, de l'autre côté de la montagne, euh, m'adresser à vous en anglais. Uh, so, let me just, uh, if I may, jump uh, immediately into the, to, to the subject that for us. This is almost the 40th anniversary of class actions in Quebec. We were introduced in 1978, um, uh, first province in, in the country to have a regime as elaborate as this one. Uh, and I, I don't wish to provide a, a chronological historical overview of what has happened in Quebec, I think what might be more fruitful uh, is to go very quickly over some of the features that define class actions in Quebec now. And many of those are peculiar to Quebec or unique to Quebec uh, as a very favorable regime of class actions relative to some other uh, jurisdictions in the Western world. Um, so a quick snapshot of where we are on some of these key parameters in the operation of class actions. Um, first, uh, I think everybody here will agree that we have a generous, some might say minimalist standard of certification or authorization of class actions on, on multiple levels. Uh, and and I, I can point to uh, maybe five or six of these, uh, of, of these characteristics. Uh, on the issue of a valid cause of action, the uh, recent jurisprudence of the Supreme Court, which has been followed by uh, everyone in Quebec, uh, limits the requirement to an arguable cause of action in French, une cause défendable, qui est, uh, je pense, un standard de simple possibilité de succès, raisonnable ou non, d'avoir gain de cause. So the arguable cause of action is the uh, uh, linchpin, I think, uh, of success in many respects at the certification stage. Second, uh, and, and on this score, I think Quebec is different from what we're going to hear uh, from um, uh, English, Canada, as well as the United States. A second dimension, which is also somewhat uh, peculiar to Quebec, is a very generous rule on standing, uh, which enables class actions to function in some respects as industry-wide inquiries. There is no need in Quebec to connect each representative's legal rights to a particular uh, defendant, it's possible for a representative to lead a class action against a range of defendants without demonstrating a uh, link between that representative's legal uh, position and the situation of the defendant, other than on the commonality dimension, which is a criterion of class action. Third, on this uh, commonality <coughs> dimension, I think there is now in Quebec a very broad concept of commonality, what I think Americans would describe as issue class actions. Uh, in the sense that one common question is enough, and that's been in place for a long time. Uh, it dates back at least to the early 1990s and to the Comité d'Environnement de la and Alcan case, in which the court uh, outlined uh, that it is sufficient to address a question that enables the case to progress uh, in, in uh, a valid way, and that's been picked up by recent jurisprudence of the Supreme Court in Finion and Vivendi, and also followed broadly, I would say, in Quebec. Fourth, uh, there is in Quebec no criterion of preferability of the class action. There is no requirement that the class action be viewed as a, as a more favorable or optimal mechanism to achieve uh, the realization of the purposes which, uh, which explain it or justify it. Uh, and that uh, might have been supplemented by some concept of proportionality, which is uh, embedded in the Code of Civil Procedure in Quebec. But as you know, uh, and again, the Supreme Court uh, is quite clear on this, the judge cannot refuse to authorize or certify a class action in Quebec on the basis of proportionality if the conditions for the authorization uh, provided by uh, code of civil procedure are met in this instance. And so there is no place where the judge can assess whether the class action itself is a proper vehicle, or an effective vehicle, or an optimal vehicle, as might be the case in jurisdictions that have a preferability requirement. Fifth, uh, and, and this is a relatively recent development, there is now an explicit judicial recognition in Quebec of the limited role 
uh, maybe limited is a lot of loaded word. I, I expected to say placeholder role, or uh, at least relatively uh, less significant role played by the representative himself or herself. There's clear indication now coming from the Court of Appeal of Quebec in particular, <coughs> and these are their words, that the lawyer initiated class action and the entrepreneurial lawyer can be viewed as a social good, which is quite an extraordinary statement, I think, coming from the judiciary, and that's been uh, uh, <coughs> mostly emerging from the, jur the jurisprudence of the Court of Appeal, and most particularly from my predecessor in the deanship at McGill, Justice Casir. Sixth, there is public funding, limited, uh, public funding, but nonetheless public funding of class actions in Quebec, which is a manifestation of strong support uh, in public policy for the value of class actions, and again, that's kind of peculiar to Quebec, with not many jurisdictions that have this regime. There are also, uh, and I, I will go faster on this, uh, substantive dimensions to uh, the current regime of class actions, which are uh, somewhat peculiar to Quebec, uh, and uh, engage, I would say, nuances or modifications or transformations of substantive law, particularly tort law or civil liability, uh, in ways that make the regime uh, more favorable. There are now, on causation issues, uh, I think quite a few decisions that apply <coughs> very generous presumptions of fact to establish connections between wrongdoing and injury. Uh, Residents of law couture and mechanisms of this sort have been used uh, quite generously in that context. And the same is true of, of nuances that have been introduced in respect of the remedies. So for instance, there is now an absolute presumption of injury under the Consumer Protection Act, Article 272, that comes from the Supreme Court decision in uh, not in a class action case, the Hishad in time decision, uh, which gives access to contractual remedies even without demonstration uh, of an injury. There are Decisions now that engage in aggregate evaluation of damages, that is, indemnisation, I would say, indemnisation forfaitaire, in the assessment of the compensation which is owed to the plaintiff. And we also have, uh, again, I would say, uh, something uh, unique to Quebec, or somewhat unique to Quebec, freestanding punitive damages, that is, the possibility of obtaining punitive damages in a class action without demonstrating uh, the need or even claiming compensatory damages. Um, I could go on. I, I think um, uh, the one thing that I might add is also the very generous uh, concept of the consumer, which is established also by the Supreme Court decision in the Bishad and Time, uh, in which the court emphasizes uh, the uh, need, from a public policy point of view, to think of consumers as crédules et inexpérimentés, so naïve and not uh, experience uh, in imposing obligations on merchants uh, in their interaction. In short, what we have, and I'm going very quickly here, we have a regime that overall evidence is a bias that's quite favorable to plaintiffs. It doesn't always work out the plaintiff's benefit, but I think it's fair to say that all of these rules evidence a bias in favor of plaintiffs. Uh, any doubt benefits the recognition and certification of class action and benefits the representative. Uh, plaintiffs and representatives don't always win, but I remind you they're given almost every chance uh, that's available by the judicial system. That has been driven, I think, uh, by uh, what is, uh, in my mind, an instrumentalist approach. And by this I mean that uh, we've severed the two objectives, or two or three objectives of class actions as separate uh, purposes, separate objectives, on the one hand serving compensation, access to justice, on the other hand serving punishment, deterrence, behavior modification, and we look at the regime and try to, to structure it in ways that maximize these two objectives as severable objectives. And that is different from the ordinary structure of private law, which normally connects these objectives. In this ordinary claim in civil liability, the plaintiff doesn't just ask for compensation and then hope for deterrence. The connection between wrongdoer and victim is an essential dimension of private law, and those two objectives are merged in the idea of liability. It's not achieving compensation in the abstract or optimizing deterrence. It is making sure that the person who wrongly caused harm compensates the plaintiff. Connection is an essential dimension 
of private law. I would say then that by driving through this instrumentalist approach and serving compensation and deterrence as several objectives, we've entered, in essence, uh, the domain of public interest litigation. I think we are now beyond, and that's been that way for many years, uh, in the context of litigation that exceeds the private interest of individuals and the uh, largest and most significant voices supporting class actions, I think we'll recognize that uh, we are well beyond achieving corrective justice in the traditional sense. The text of the civil code, the code of civil procedure rather, is never viewed as an, opt uh, as an obstacle to this broad, generous, I would say, classification of <coughs> private interest. No one thinks of the code of civil procedure as limiting uh, the uh, um, reach of class actions in respect of these alternative courts. And so I want to end on this. How am I doing for time? Maybe five, two or three minutes? Yeah. Okay. So let me end on, on this. So I, I think. Um, I think there's a paradox here. And the paradox is that even though this is public interest litigation in some form, paradoxically, there's been marginal impact of class actions in public law and in areas that involve social transformation uh, in, uh, in uh, the broadest sense. We have in Quebec, in particular, a stable, relatively stable jurisprudence excluding class actions where no monetary relief is sought declaratory judgments, injunctions, freestanding, that is on their own without a claim for monetary damages, are viewed as uh, inappropriate in the context of class actions because they're viewed as unnecessary. The plaintiff can get the same result, an injunction or declaratory judgment, uh, without uh, engaging the complex machinery of class actions. And that dates back to Guimont and was uh, restated in Marta, the case that Marie Laurent argued in the Supreme Court. But interestingly, there is nothing in the Code of Civil Procedure which actually dictates that result. If you look at the old version of the Code of Civil Procedure, or the more recent version of the Code of Civil Procedure, in my view, there is nothing in there that dictates that we limit class actions to monetary relief or to claims that involve monetary, monetary relief. There are very few examples of the use of class actions in uh, uh, social transformation contexts. They're quite famous. One, one can think of uh, St. Ferdinand, uh, Gus Lane, uh, Supreme Court decisions. There are a number of uh, cases that involve uh, health uh, services, social services. I'm thinking of uh, CHSLD, a laundry uh, service that we'll call CLNG on breast cancer. And, and most recently, the case of Marcel, which is making its way uh, through, uh, through the Quebec uh, judicial structure that involves uh, 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 free access to, uh, I'm doing the translation in my head as I go, against Piscara, free access to uh, instruction and the fees that are charged to parents for, uh, for books and variety of, of school supplies. Uh, and there, um, there's been very little success, I would say, uh, more broadly on constitutional rights. The Gus Lane case, uh, it was on social benefits, it failed on substance in 2002 in the Supreme Court. His lot was successful. We call this one as uh, Canadian Pension Fund Survivorship Provision for Same Sex Couples, but was successful in a forward manner uh, because of the rules that we have with respect to indemnification uh, in the context of uh, uh, constitutional rights. Uh, and uh, one can think of Alberta and elder advocates, I and mean, we could go in there in, in the conversation. Now, what's interesting here is that if you compare the uh, success or lack thereof in Quebec with respect to social transformation class actions to the roots of class actions, there is a surprise. <coughs> one of the primary roots, not the only one, but one of the primary roots of class actions in the United States was civil rights litigation. Class actions were a vehicle for civil rights litigation uh, that uh, was uh, especially captured, I think, by some of the amendments in 1966 of the federal uh, rules of civil procedure. So why is it that in the absence of a text in the, civil, in, in the Code of Civil Procedure excluding those remedies, why is it that we have not developed a significant jurisprudence in public law? I don't have an explanation. Let me throw ideas which need to be tested. Class actions emerged in Quebec in the late 1970s in a climate that was more focused on consumer rights than constitutional rights. It is, in time, 
coexistent with the introduction of a, a Consumer Protection Act with some teeth, and I think focus then was significant. At the same time, late 1970s, monetized class actions were also uh, increasingly popular in the United States, and so I think that explains in some measure why that became the model here. One might argue that uh, those years also witnessed the shift in the market for legal services. This is also coextensive with the introduction of the No-Fault Automobile Insurance Act, creating a vacuum that perhaps uh, brought lawyers to focus on consumer litigation. There is obviously, and I think most significantly, the parallel emergence uh, of public interest standing in Canada. Because at the same time that we introduced class actions in Quebec, the Supreme Court was becoming more open to granting individuals and organizations public interest standing uh, without resorting to the complex machinery of class actions. I'm thinking of the trilogy of Thorson, McNeil, and Borowski, obviously, that opened up the field. It slowed down a bit, uh, I think, with the decision of the Supreme Court and Canadian Council of Churches after the Canadian Charter of Rights became uh, a proper vehicle. Uh, for uh, for uh, defending civil rights, but then I think we've returned most recently to a very generous regime of public interest standing uh, with the decisions of the Supreme Court in downtown Eastside sex workers and Manitoba Métis Federation. Right now, basically, any organization or any individual can bring forward a case uh, with not too many obstacles in the criterion that have, uh, that have brought the Supreme Court uh, to recognize this is a vehicle for constitutional challenges. And then one last thing, I think that the, there are obviously in Canada uh, significant restrictions on award for damages, retroactive award for damages in the context of constitutional uh, claims, uh, so that seeking declaratory relief of unconstitutionality doesn't really generate much resources or money. I think it's difficult perhaps to finance these things without uh, that kind of support. So, I, I want to conclude on that. I think there are some explanations, but I think there is nonetheless a big loss here. There's an opportunity that has been missed uh, in respect of aggregation in the public interest. Not necessarily just in public law, but aggregation of claims in the public interest. And I, I, was tell, I, I was saying to my wife yesterday, I'm not sure how to finish. I, I, it, 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 I have this on the tip of my tongue. I don't quite know how to explain it. But I think there needs to be an effort to correlate public interest standing and declaratory uh, 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 remedies and injunctive remedies on one hand and what's going on in class actions on the other hand. There may be circumstances in which uh, what is now pursued as public interest standing cases would be better pursued as class actions. Some circumstances, for instance, might make uh, meeting the third criterion of public interest standing uh, easier to meet. There is funding that is available in Quebec. One might overcome mootness issues. Arguably, there are some systemic uh, review dimensions that are met. And uh, if you want, I can go into some examples. But most interestingly, I think class actions are a, a mobilization vehicle, They're a vehicle for public education and mobilization. And we've missed that dimension perhaps by focusing on organization uh, getting uh, public interest standing. I'm, I'm a bit hesitant on this because it's possible that these organizations themselves are proper vehicles for mobilization. Conversely, I think some of the class actions that have been authorized and that look like fast uh, public inquiries into some public policies might be better presented as uh, claims for declaratory judgment. There may be more now uh, coming uh, our way. There's quite a few cases now emerging on sexual harassment, racial harassment, uh, involving uh, RCMP, Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, there are a few cases emerging now on prison uh, and correction services, solitary confinement, things like that, which are forward-looking and intended to achieve some kind of social transformation. I think we may see some of those, but they also rest uh, in very strong light on the monetized dimension of these claims which make them, in some respects, more problematic. So let me talk about that. No, it, it's interesting, in, in listening to you, uh, uh, the Supreme Court has over and over written that class action is merely a procedural vehicle and it doesn't change substantive law. At the time I read that, I'm like, yeah, right. 
And, and when I listen to you, uh, I'm thinking of the mascot case, not my mascot, but you were too polite to say I unsuc unsuccessfully argued. But the mascot <laughs> against the bank, where the rule of standing was really relaxed, and I'm thinking also of causation in the tobacco in, in Quebec. Uh, Professor Walker, uh, the standing rule in Ontario, I think it was in the Ragumena decision. You know the standing rule? I think it, it still stands in the... Which is already... Uh, in the phone app, just uh, even as we speak, so we will see. Oh, uh, really interesting. So I'd like to hear you a bit on the effect of class action in Ontario since 1999. Um, but when I look at our colleagues, uh, Sam and uh, Daniel, uh, and uh, Rosinka and some others here, um, I see the young Turks who are up against the ramparts, agitating and advocating on behalf of this exciting new procedure. And in the twinkling of an eye, here we are reminiscing about how the procedure began and now how it has changed over the years. And so I would like to take us back to that moment in time, at least for uh, Ontario and English Canada, when it all began, uh, to sort of capture that sentiment, that uh, imagination of the legislature, uh, the early appreciation by the juge, and the public, and how, so we can sort of set a mark, a symbol that has gone into what uh, Professor Hitchcock has spoken about uh, just now. Um, at that time, it was clearly a legal transfer. There is no question. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea, but we had no model, no plan. And so the Ontario Law Reform Commission in the early 1980s uh, examined the matter in great detail and borrowed a great deal from Federal Rule 23. And one of the key things that they borrowed was the three main objectives um, access to justice, judicial economy, <coughs> behavior modification. But it was very much a legal transform even in those days. And even the Law Reform Commission, before we came to legislation, before we came to judicial interpretation, uh, understood those three objectives, not necessarily to be disaggregated as we described now, but certainly very unequal. And so if I can take each of them individually just for a moment, access to justice, which I will come back to, who can argue with that? And certainly not at that time, but I will come back to that in a moment. Judicial economy. Well, judicial economy is a bit of an anomaly here because if we are now bringing claims that would never have been brought because now individually, economically unviable claims are available, are we not increasing the number of claims? And I will pause to say that we had in Canada a rather different situation from the United States in that the claims that were small consumer claims or small claims of one sort or another, many of those were absorbed in administrative processes and were not in the ordinary courts. We had a few <coughs> odd examples of oh, you know, cars, uh, we had uh, the Mississauga train union and, and people <coughs> said, well, if we had to bring these individuals in, we would the courts. But we did not have that massive inventory litigation we would tend to see in the United States that was a serious concern. So judicial economy, although no one would ever vote against it, was not really a driving force at the time. Turning to behavior modification, yes, it was listed as an objective. But even the Ontario Law Reform Commission had a um, had its reservations about this and was ambivalent. And I'm thumbing my telephone not because I have any time. It's because I marked a little quotation 
from the OLRC report. Uh, and at page 145, they say, the justification for endorsing class actions, aggregating individually recoverable and non-recoverable claims, lies mainly in the ability of these types of class actions to achieve either judicial economy or increased access to justice. Behavior modification is essentially an inevitable, albeit important, byproduct of class actions. So at that time, even the legislators had some reservations. When we come to the urban judicial interpretations, you might say it's just speculation, but in fact, in Ontario and in other uh, jurisdictions, it's not entirely so, because in contrast with Quebec, we do have preferability. And preferability has been used as a loose kind of uh, interpreted uh, overall reference to the purposes of class actions. And in fact, um, in a much earlier study, perhaps after 10 or 12 years of the procedure being in place, I looked at references under preferability to the objectives, and I could not find a single case in which the courts had said, we need to certify this class because it will promote behavior modification. All of the uh, positive endorsement for class actions, the certifications that were successful, were certified in the name of access to justice. I think that is changing, and we will discuss that for the day. But it's not the fact, but it's good. Uh, but at that time, there were serious reservations about the behavior modification. So let's return for a moment to access to justice. Well, we know everyone's in favor of access to justice. Everyone's in favor of mother life. And everyone is in favor, at least in North America, of apple pie. Uh, but these things mean many different things to many different people. So you might say access, overcoming what barriers, and to justice. What kind of justice? And I think in those days, it was certainly quite clear that access meant overcoming, at least in Ontario and in Commonwealth Canada, overcoming financial barriers. Financial barriers. And I contrast this with barriers uh, of recognizing uh, a right of action. So they were not expansive. Uh, it's a very substantive right, and here you see it time and again, this is really a central tool and not a tool to change uh, the rights of things. But there it is based on uh, the financial aspects of human information or information. And why it was, what was driving that into me? Well, it was, as Professor uh, Jutra uh, has mentioned, it was a rise in uh, a sense of consumer rights um, and a recognition now of the serious cost of uh, finance litigation. And back through the 90s, what you will recall, uh, uh, brought on a huge wave of civil justice reform, which was meant to deal with the high cost of justice. And it occurred also in the context of an enormous retrenchment in uh, the availability of legal aid. So legal aid was ceasing to become a tool for civil justice and becoming uh, a, a vendor, primarily to criminal defendants. So that was the barrier that was being addressed. And now we say to justice. What kind of justice? Meaning, what kind of remedies, what kind of relief for what kinds of claims? And I will say that at least in Commonwealth Canada, it was not consumer in the way we most commonly think of it, the consumer right. It was the rights of members of the public who had received or benefited, should I say, dare I say, involuntarily from the provision of mass public max services, uh, services programs. And I will give an example that I think will highlight that. Uh, this is the classic example we had in the early uh, Supreme Court litigation of Trilogy. And the two that I'm going to have a call on 
And those who too want to involve uh, the rights of uh, residences of uh, an institution, the other involved the rights of, uh, of um, people who reside in the area of a public uh, landfill. And there was, in some ways, little to distinguish the reasons for granting certification to one and refusing certification to, uh, to another. And indeed, the rights of uh, residences or inmates in an institution were regarded with great sympathy by the court, and they were granted uh, certification. The rights of uh, members of the community who had suffered from noise, uh, smell, possibly, and, uh, and loss of property value were uh, looked on less favorably uh, for aggravation cases. And so in the preferability test, one uh, succeeded and one failed. Uh, in my view, uh, this was the sense of access to justice uh, for uh, those who have uh, suffered a harm in uh, the course of receiving uh, um, a mass provided uh, good or services, uh, but who uh, were, were looked upon with great sympathy, uh, not as voluntary consumers, but you know, as involuntary consumers. I think this is also reflected in the early medical devices class actions, breast implant litigation, peacemaker litigation, even on the shop protesters. You get a breast implant because you need a breast implant. You go to Trimble and shop for a pacemaker piece. You get a pacemaker because you have a medical condition and it's recommended to you. So these were the kinds of, if you will, consumers or members of the public who were uh, looked upon favorably. I think, and, and less so, and even today we see the people in other places, less so than those who uh, suffered sort of loss of property value. Why is such a distinction in those days? Um, and, and to a certain extent continue today, perhaps to a certain extent. Um, I think for the same reasons that we have a distinction in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms that we have between property rights on the one hand in the US and between security of the person in Canada, which is being protected. I think that that is consistent uh, with um, the tradition that existed uh, certainly in Commonwealth Canada, uh, perhaps to a certain extent in Canada. I think that that is changed over time. Very much, I can just uh, make a brief marker. Along the way, uh, Craig Jones uh, wrote the theory of class actions, and a very thoughtful moment. Uh, uh, reviewing and thinking hard of these various objectives. His conclusion was effectively the real, the real contribution to be made by class actions ultimately is in its regulatory future, its behavior modification. And I think that that has been very slow to take off. Uh, in, uh, in Commonwealth Canada, it's been a very conservative approach. We want to assume <coughs> what we would regard as traditional sympathetic litigants to get to the court and get substantive uh, compensation for ordinary harms. That is evolving over time. And I think, frankly, it's going to be good. Gradual acceptance of uh, entrepreneurial litigation on behalf of rights that are coming to be recognized uh, for uh, the broader consumer. And Professor Walker, what you're saying ties with what the captain was uh, saying in the introduction that class actions and regulations somewhere walk with towards the same goal. And uh, having uh, Professor Isakarov here from uh, NYU, uh, Professor Isakarov, um, on that on that thought, with the new uh, uh, administration, with the President Trump administration in the U.S., where we see that. Uh, regulation, he wants to uh, reduce, reduce regulation, and I think the Department of Justice uh, will enforce, uh, uh, doesn't intend to enforce that intent to be uh, transgender rights or uh, equal, equal pay for women. Uh, so it, will that be a golden age for class action lawyers in public, uh, in public law that will take over? Well, let me, thank you. Uh, let me uh, 
answer that in the course of how I, I want to introduce the theme of why class actions. And um, of course, of course uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, the work of the Lalo Park here is, is really quite astounding. It's the most systematic effort to understand uh, this form of, of legal activity. Um, so let me pick up exactly where Janet and Kathleen uh, introduced this on the point of regulation. Um, I think that any argument for class actions that takes up the mantra of access to justice, um, collective regress, uh, um, behavior modification is ultimately going to be incoherent. And it will be incoherent because those three criteria um, generally are the reason for the regulatory state. When we talk about why we have uh, public regulation, why we have a state, it is generally in terms of the efficiency of the provision of public goods in the service of a regulatory objective. And so when I give talks on class actions, particularly abroad, out of the US, and particularly in civil law jurisdictions, I begin by saying that the key question in class actions is the relationship between private enforcement and public uh, regulation. And that's exactly uh, Larry, what you're getting at with the question about how do class actions relate to a change of political administration. And I'd suggest that one of the reasons that the class action device had so much success in the last 50 years in the United States is precisely because of the American collective and sometimes pathological distrust of government authority. Um, and that we search for alternatives to the monopolistic power of the state. You know, to say that in a French-speaking country is a horrible thing to say, I know. But uh, some of us resisted the Napoleonic uh, uh, incursions into many parts of the world. And the uh, American class action, uh, I think, to give you 50 years of class action history in just a few minutes, revolves around three questions. And they are all on the relationship between class action and state authority. And the first and most important uh, genesis of the modern class action was as a vehicle to promote litigation antagonistic to state authority. Uh, and it is critical to understand that, that when the modern form was shaped in the 1966 revisions and in the discussions going up to it, the driving force behind that was to legitimate Brown versus Board of Education. Brown versus Board of Education is a private collective action against the will of the political majority. And the political majority was racist, it imposed segregation in the schools, and the class action reforms through what's called the B2, the Adjunctive Declaratory Provision of Rule 23, was designed to give a procedural protection to these kinds of actions against the state. Let me give one modern case that gives an example of how successful that is to the point that we don't even challenge it in the United States anymore. There's a case within the last 10 years in California called Brown versus Plateau. The case involves prison overcrowding in California, and there's a lawsuit brought to force the state to either provide more resources to the prisons, which it could not do, or to release prisoners. Extraordinary uh, judicial mechanism. What's amazing about this case is it goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, as it often does, divides five to four. It divides five to four on whether the conditions of confinement were in fact unconstitutional, whether they reached the threshold of cruel and unusual. They did not question, not one of the justices questioned the class action basis of the lawsuit. And this lawsuit could only work as a class action because the demand was to release prisoners. Every single prisoner had been properly convicted, at least for the purposes of assumption of that litigation, which meant they could, any individual could only bring a damages action if the terms of his or her confinement were, were unlawful. And instead, 
the remedy was that California shall reduce its prison population by 20% over a very small number of years. People were going to walk out of the prisons as a result of the class action. And the only question that the Supreme Court accepted was whether or not that was indeed proper as a merits decision, not on the procedure. So that has been institutionalized in the United States in a way that we don't think twice about class actions being used to challenge the state. And we welcome private litigants. We have attorney's fees, one-way fee shifting provisions that subsidize these actions. There is a lot of ways in which they get off the ground. And so that is the origin. Now, as time went on, the other provisions of the 66 reforms, which is mostly the B3, the monetized version, took over and they took hold. And they were the dominant feature in part because a lot of money changes hands. And one immediate question was what's the relationship between the new private class action and the regulatory state? And it turned out in the most successful areas of class action practice in the United States, the class action became a supplement or a complement to public regulatory authority. So it turns out that public entities are very bad at compensating individuals. When there's a suit brought, a parent's patriarch suit by the state or by the federal government on behalf of injured persons, they tend to collect and they tend to keep the money, right? Because why give it away? You got it, right? It's easier than collecting taxes. You just have this money and you don't distribute it. The private sector is very good at distributing money because they're incentivized to do so by a contingency recovery. And so we've had a division of labor in the United States. The Federal Trade Commission, the Department of Justice can prosecute antitrust, anti-competitive actions in the United States. They almost never get compensation for anybody. Victims of unlawful antitrust activity, Sherman Act activity, rely upon the private bar to bring follow-on lawsuits to collect the damages and distribute them. The same thing effectively happens in the securities area where the combination of regulatory filings and occasional actions by the Securities and Exchange Commission signal who are the malefactors. There's a company who rewrites its earnings, things of that sort, and then it's left to the private bar to seek compensation, to seek enforcement of the decree. And that division has been remarkably stable in the United States. The law is complicated and there's lots of cases that come up in both antitrust and securities, but basically the nutshell version of it is it's been pretty much in place and stable for about 40 years now. And the private bar does very well in this and government officials have learned how to work with the private bar. If you take the recent VW Volkswagen admissions scandal case in California that was just resolved and is now on appeal, there you see a more elaborate version of this partnership between private and public in that you had criminal prosecutions, you had state and federal regulatory actions, but the organizing device to get a remedy in that case was a class action concentrated in San Francisco through a multi-district litigation practice. So that coordination of public and private through the class action has been extremely successful in the United States. And for all the controversies about ambulance chasing lawyers and entrepreneurialism is a bad word except when it's the Chamber of Commerce and all that sort of thing. For all that controversy, it's been stable. So here's the one place where class actions have been problematic in the United States right from the get-go. And that's when the class action is altogether a substitute for the failure of the state to regulate. And there are vast domains where state action is just not found. For example, states are very bad at protecting consumers. They don't know how to regulate consumer behavior. We have a system in the United States where we want to be as liberal as possible in getting products to market. We want to be the innovators. We want to get things there. And we rely on ex post enforcement, which means if you bring a product to market and it injures or it defrauds or it harms, our regulatory mechanism is lawsuits after the fact. 
And it turns out that the state has no particular advantage in ex post regulation as opposed to ex ante regulation. And so we rely upon the enforcement mechanism of the private bar. But there, the private bar, through the development of the common law, is also the leading regulatory authority. This has been where our law is most problematic. And I'll give you two examples to close. The first is, on the consumer level, we have had a Supreme Court that has had to confront this issue only recently because of a jurisdictional shift under what we call the Class Action Fairness Act that brought all these cases into federal court only in the last 10 years. And that has prompted a reaction from the Supreme Court of, oh my God, are we really going to hear all these consolidated, complicated state law claims that pose a lot of problems because these are all national market products, but the state law claims arise under 50 different state laws, and how do you meld those, and how do you get those together? And, you know, our Quebec is Louisiana. How do you even understand the words of the Louisiana Code? These are problems for us in how to organize this, how to bedevil our courts. Well, the Supreme Court's reaction was to give full legal enforcement to the new tool to avoid class action accountability, which is the mandatory arbitration provision in every consumer contract. So you cannot buy a product today in the United States that doesn't have a waiver of class actions, a designation of mandatory arbitration. And the Supreme Court thus far has enforced this across the board. There's a couple of areas that are gray zones. There's a case that the court will hear next term on whether under the labor laws, the right to collective action for the union laws can override the class action waiver in the employment contract. But that's tinkering at the side. This has been a major source of defeat for class actions, quite frankly, and it's been a defeat for private enforcement because it puts everything either in the individual's hands or in the state's hands. It doesn't allow for that intermediary private attorney general that has driven the class action in other areas. The second is we've had trouble figuring out the relationship between the class action and the personal injury. And we've taken, we've tended to view personal injuries as the high level of individual recourse. We have a Kantian sense that the individual bodily integrity is just so important that you would never want to cede that to a collective action. And so we have cases that basically say that our formal predominance requirement can't be satisfied in a personal injury action. So it's quite fascinating to see the Quebec tobacco litigation. And this has been something that our courts have resisted until very recently. This is an area of ferment right now. So we've had two major cases recently. I'll confess I was involved in both of them, so I like these opinions because they're the position I argued for. But even if I weren't involved, they would be objectively correct. So we don't have to worry about partisanship and effectiveness. And the first was the NFL concussion settlement in which the court accepted that there really could be a collective resolution of personal injury cases when there were sufficient elements of individual participation, even though you had a class action, and where the common source of behavior was so overwhelming that that really had to drive the litigation. The second one was an opinion that was handed down yesterday by the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals en banc involving tobacco. And in Florida, there had been a class action trial on tobacco's liability to a class. It was a complicated case. It was in state court. And this is cross, what we call cross-jurisdictional preclusion issues. They're very complicated. But the question was whether it would violate the due process rights of the tobacco defendants to have the findings of liability then be applied in follow-on individual actions. And 
we have the, the common law jury tradition, which means there has to be a front-to-back presentation of liability and damages and remedy and everything else in one proceeding. And the court, and I'll just read you uh, a little, uh, just a couple of sentences, uh, the court uh, by a very conservative judge, Judge William Pryor, an excellent judge, one of the people who's discussed as a possible Trump nominee in the Supreme Court, he said, we have a number of tools to decide individual damages in a class action, including bifurcating liability and damage trials with the same or different juries, appointing a magistrate judge or special master to preside over individual damages proceeding, and decertifying the class after the liability trial, and providing notice to class members concerning how they may proceed to prove damages. This is a level of experimentation which 10 years ago was inconceivable in the American court. So we're trying to figure out how to handle this third category of claims where the state is not a participant and where the private action really takes on the broad regulatory functions, the, both the deterrence and the compensation. And that's the area where there's the most tension at present. Very interesting. So we're kind of uh, elaborately with the tobacco case to see how. You're way out in front. <laughs> Wait, no, seriously, you, you, this is uh, extraordinary. But there's some features of, of, of Quebec that I learned about only yesterday that are interesting. So, for example, every one of the claimants here has gone through the public health system. So there's a, a centralized repository of information. Just finding out in, in Florida tobacco litigation has been going on for almost 30 years. Every single plaintiff is dead. They're all dead. No, they're, they're, okay, so here's, a, here's an epidemiological fact. Smokers with cancer are not a long-lived population. There, there are very good studies on this. So, um, they're, not, they're dead. And so it's their relatives. So finding the records, finding who are the heirs, finding unearthing medical records from 30 years ago when these people were being diagnosed is a very difficult undertaking. And so you have some features that are beneficial here.